never had the seen a service stop for technical difficulties, but hey, that's all right. We're back up and running. It's so good to see everybody out this morning. We do have some that are visiting with us. We're really glad that you've taken the time to be here. To those that are on Zoom, we're glad that you are here with us virtually as well. If you would take out your Bibles, go ahead and turn over to Matthew chapter 5. If you want to, go place a marker there. That's where we're almost going to be exclusively for this lesson, looking a little bit at the Sermon on the Mount. And as you're turning there, Haley and I this this week, we we actually feel like we're official Utah residents now. Uh, we, We learned how to ski this week. And that was an exciting endeavor. There were only minor casualties involved in that. Uh, and everybody tells you that skiing isn't that hard. You'll get, you'll get the hang of it. And I think for the most part that's true. Obviously, like anything that's new, it's difficult. But you can get the hang of it. But what people don't really set you up for is realizing, like, just the feeling of how awkward it is when you put those boots on for the first time. You put those ski boots on, you're trying to walk around, and you feel out of place. You, can't, you feel like you just don't even know how to walk, and everybody's looking at you. Uh, when it's your first time, you're, uh, you're second-guessing what do we wear when it's jackets, gloves, hats. You know, we, we don't want to look like we're noobs out there. We, we want to try and at least look like we know what we're doing. And then once you get on the skis, well, you look like a newborn giraffe, and that's all there is to it. Everybody can tell that you're new at that. And you know, there's a lot of things in life that we do that we, we want to stick out at. But I think for the most part, many of us in life, we, we just want to blend in. We, we just want to go under the radar. We don't want any undue attention. We don't want to cause a scene. We, we don't like to stick out. But I want you to consider something in Matthew chapter 5 that we're going to be looking at that that's not Christ's intent for us as his disciples. That's not what he wants us to live our life on this earth as people that are just trying to blend in. That was never the intent for us. He wants us to be different. There's a passage that really gets that across for us in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 13 through 16. Some imagery and metaphors here that you're probably familiar with. Matthew chapter 5, let's begin in verse 13. It says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Notice what we're called to be. Salt and light. I think we have even the youngest of kids that are here are familiar with these terms. You know, we sing songs about them. This little light of mine. And, and we pray in our prayers oftentimes that we will be salt and light. And so we talk about this idea a lot. That this is the type of people that Christ expects us to be. But at the same time, what does that mean? Well, what does it really mean? And what does it more importantly look like in our lives to actually be salt and to be light? What's Jesus getting at with these metaphors and these descriptions of who we're supposed to be? I want you to think about it this way. What gives light and what gives salt their power? It's speaking to that of their influence. For instance, when food is boring and it's bland, what do you do? You put some salt on it and it brings it to life. It gives it some more flavor. When a room is dark and you get just a tiny bit of light, what happens? It brightens up the whole room. You're able to see what is in front of you. And so when Jesus is using these descriptions and metaphors of us being salt and light, he's talking about our influence. And that's something that we need to greatly consider as followers of God. Consider the impact that we are having on the world. I think many of you are familiar with the name Gandhi. And Gandhi was one of the influential leaders of India In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, a spiritual leader for the people of India as they were trying to to get their independence from England. And he was just a very vocal Hindu during that time. But did you know there was a chance in Gandhi's life that he actually might have become a Christian? He was a young lawyer and he was working in the country of South Africa. And he heard a number of the people that were locals there talking about Jesus and this Christian way. And so he went to a Christian service for about a month. And in his diary, this is what he wrote. 
He said, the congregation did not strike me as being particularly religious. They were not an assembly of devout souls, but appeared to be worldly-minded people going to church for recreation and in conformity to custom. And with such an observation, can you really blame the man for never going back? For never seeing the need to become a Christian, to never inquiring more about the way of Jesus, because what he saw was people that were no different than the world around him. A few years later, Gandhi wrote in his, uh, in his personal diary, he wrote, If Christians would really live the teachings of Christ, as found in the Bible, all of India would be Christians today. And what a thought that is. One of the most populated countries on the earth, approaching a billion, I think. All because the people that he saw when he went to that Christian service, they didn't live what, what they professed. They, they weren't seen, there wasn't a, a visible difference in the way that they lived their lives. They, they weren't living as salt and light. And that's the importance of what we are talking about this morning. But as you look in Matthew chapter 5 with me, in this Sermon on the Mount, we're going to look in chapter 5 and in chapter 6 predominantly in this lesson. There, there's many patterns when you study the Sermon on the Mount. For instance, in chapter 5, where Jesus will often begin a statement or a little section saying, you have heard, and then he'll quote something from the Old Testament, but then he will say, but I say to you, and give them a new teaching on it. Or you get to chapter 7, and there's oftentimes two paths that are contrasted, two ways, the right and the wrong. But I want you to look at another pattern with me for this lesson. Because there's three times in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus will mention the Gentiles. He's going to mention the Gentiles. And that word simply means other nation. Some of your translations may even have the word pagan or heathen. And I know that may sound a little bit harsh, but all the word Gentile is really getting across is somebody that's not in a relationship with, with God. Somebody that's not in a covenant relationship with him. And that's the way that I'm going to be using that term throughout this lesson. But I want you to see why Jesus mentions the Gentiles in this sermon. And the, the point is that the disciples of Jesus live differently. They live differently than the world around them. And so what we're going to be talking about this morning is not all-inclusive. But we are going to look at the three ways that Jesus points out in this sermon of how we can be different from the Gentiles, from the world around us that isn't in a relationship with God. That there should be identifiable differences in how we are living. That we should be living as salt and light. One author said this, and then we'll move in. Uh, to the three different areas that we're going to be studying this morning. He said this, he said, Many people in the world will only ever see the light of Jesus in his word if they see it in us. And so how bright is our light shining? How much flavor are we adding to the world around us? Are we living as salt and light? And so simply put, don't live like the Gentiles. And how do we do that? We're going to look at three things that Jesus points out. And the first is found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. The, the fact that the Gentiles, they, they love the greet and love their brethren. And you may be looking at that at first on the, on the PowerPoint or on the handout saying they greet and love their brethren. Like, what's wrong with that? Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that what we do? We're supposed, we just talked about a whole lesson last week about loving one another, loving our brethren. I'm going to qualify that in a second. But before we get to that, I want to start by reading verses 43 through 45. Where it says, Matthew chapter 5, 43 through 45, it says, But you have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And we'll pause there. Jesus is commanding us. He's instructing us. He's turning this, this idea from the Old Testament that it's okay to, to love those who love you, but your enemies, it's okay to mistreat them. He says, no, that's not the way. Love your enemies. In fact, pray for those that would mistreat you. And I think we have a misconception about this word enemy. When I've studied this with people before and talked about it, even in uh, Bible class settings, people are so quick to say, well, well, I don't have any enemies in my life. I, you know, that, that's just wrong to have enemies. Maybe your life is so good that you don't have any enemies. Maybe that's true. But Jesus goes on to warn throughout the Gospels that if you're living as true salt and light, 
you're not only going to have enemies, you're going to make enemies by the differences that is seen in your life and the way that you are living. And so the idea of an enemy, it's somebody that has enmity with you, somebody that treats you with hostility. There's strife. It's a difficult and strained relationship. So there's nothing sinful about having enemies. It is sinful if we treat our enemies the same way they treat us. But just because we have enemies, that doesn't mean that there's anything necessarily wrong with us. In fact, when Jesus tells us that we're going to have enemies, that's something we need to be on guard against. But Jesus takes us a step further. He doesn't just say to love your enemies. Now what he also says in those verses we just read, to pray for those that persecute you. And when you do that, you will be a son or a daughter of God. In verse 45. Well, what makes you a son or daughter of God because you love your enemy? How how does that make you a son or daughter of God? Well, it's the fact that verse 45 points out that that's the way that God treats all people, both the evil and the righteous. That he makes the sun come out. He makes the rain come down. He, He provides so that the cycles of life can continue both for the good and for the evil. And so that's the same type of love, unconditional love, that we are supposed to have toward all men both good and those who are our enemies. But I want our attention to be in verses 46 and 47, where we see that word Gentile appear. Matthew 5, 46, it says, For for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? And this is where it's important to clarify what's on the PowerPoint. That there's nothing wrong with greeting and loving your brethren, but what does Jesus add in verse 47? It's when you only greet your brethren. When you're only nice to those that are nice to you. When those that that it's easy to get along with, those are the only people that you love, the only people that you show kindness to. You are no better, you are no different than the people of the world. And that's something that we need to think about. That a general fact of society is that people look after their own. They look after their own family, their own tribe, their own community, the people that they get along with, the people that are in their circle. It doesn't matter how wicked somebody may be. For the most part, our society as a whole, we look after the people that are close to us. You don't have to be a religious person to understand that. And that's the point that Jesus is making. And that idea of greeting someone doesn't mean that you put your hand out and you shake their hand and ask how they're doing. The idea of greeting somebody is you care for another's welfare. That you care for this person and how they're doing in life. And so how are we doing with that? Do we do that to the people that would mistreat us, the people that would harm us, that would wrong us and sin against us and waiting for your downfall? Do you love them? Do you greet them? And so the true test for us that are Christians and claim to be disciples and followers of Christ is not how do we treat those that love us, but how do we treat those that hate us, those that would mistreat us, those that maybe we're inclined to hate. Again, it it is so easy to love people who love you. That's why for the most part, for the most part, we get along very well with people in our family. Our spiritual family and our physical family. Why? Because they care for you. They should. And in most cases, that's the relationship that we enjoy with those that are in our family. But what Jesus is asking us to do is to consider and think more deeply about this. How do we treat those that would wrong us? It's people. Maybe it's a coworker that purposefully is trying to get under your skin. That, that is waiting for your downfall, not just to see you be crushed, but so they can rejoice when that happens. Do you love that person? Jesus calls us to love more. And I want to read, it's a little bit of a lengthy quote from Edwin Crozier. He's a preacher down in Tampa. Uh, and he has a book called The Gospel of the Kingdom, which uh, I got this quote from. And, He's explaining in this quote what it means to love our enemies like Jesus wants us to. And this is what he says. We are supposed to be patient with people who are impatient with us. We are supposed to be kind to people who are unkind to us. We are supposed to refrain from jealousy and arrogance in relation to those who are jealous or arrogant. They will behave unbecomingly, seek their own, be easily provoked, and keep score. But we must not respond like that. 
They will rejoice when we are in unrighteousness, but we must rejoice only in truth and righteousness. They will abandon us in all circumstances and believe the worst about us at all times, but we must still believe the best about them and be there to help them bear their heavy loads. We must love those who do not love us. It's easy to read that quote, but man, is that tough to live. But that's the difference that Christ calls us to be in the world. That's what it means to be salt and light. If you want to make a difference, you want to make an impact on the world, don't just love those that love you. That's easy. Even the non-believers, even people that don't know anything about the Lord, they can do that. But to those that know the Lord, they exhibit the same unconditional love that he shows. They exhibit that even to the worst of people, even to those that are their enemies. And so do we look like sinners of the world? Or do we look like sons and daughters of God? The answer will be seen in not just how we love our family, but how we love our enemies. Next time that we see the Gentiles mentioned in Matthew, in this sermon, is in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7. And to set this up a little bit, in the first 18 verses of Matthew chapter 6, what Jesus is talking about here is the idea of serving and doing good things, but doing them in secret. Like, then, and what he means by that is that the, the deeds that we do should not be a public spectacle so that we receive the praise and we receive the glory. God's saying, don't, don't ta- Jesus is saying, don't take the righteousness that is meant for God and make it all about you. And so that, that's really where the context of verse 7 will appear. And that's very, it's a very good reminder in a lesson like this. We're, we're striving to be different, to be salt and light in the world. But we better be doing that for God's glory and not for my own glory. I shouldn't be doing it for a big pat on the back so everybody can see how righteous I am. That, that's not the purpose of being salt and light. It's to tell others about God and so that he will receive the glory from them. But in Matthew chapter 5 through 6, verses 5 through 15, he's talking about prayer. Notice what is said in particular about the Gentiles in verse 7. Matthew 6, 7, it says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by, for their many words. I'm reading from the ESV, and it, it refers to their praying as empty phrases. Some of your translations may say vain repetition. An idea here is somebody that's a babbler. They, they just talk, and they talk, and they talk. There may not be really much to it, but they're going to keep talking. They're, they're going to keep adding stuff to it because, well, isn't that what God wants? That's what Jesus is condemning here, this idea of just saying many words to be heard. You know, when, when I first started preaching, I, not on a full-time basis, but just uh, I, how it came about is a long story. I won't get into it, but I was 16 years old, and I started preaching, and I could barely get a lesson over 15 minutes. And people afterwards would tease me about that. And they're like, oh, man, you know, you'll, you'll be able to get them longer one day. And I look back at it actually now, and they were teasing me because they were thankful that it was under 15 minutes. They got the lunch faster. <laughs> but you know what that did to me? I, I heard some people teasing me that I couldn't preach long. And, and I thought the longer a sermon was, the better it would be. So what did I do? Well, I packed some just repetitious phrases in the lesson, trying to just add some verses in there and just trying to make it longer because as if it's longer, that means it will obviously be better. I was wrong. That's exactly what the Gentiles do with their prayers. They, they think because they just say more words that they're more likely to be heard. And so that's the basis for why they pray. But I want you to see that the, that the emphasis here is on the, the vein and the emptiness of what they're saying, not the idea of repetitions, not the idea of repeating something. And I think that's important. And for, that, for us to see that, turn over to Matthew chapter 26. Leave a, leave a marker in the Sermon on the Mount. We'll be coming back to that. But remember when Jesus is praying in the garden? In Matthew 26 and verse 39, we're we're told that in going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And what happens in the next few verses? He leaves the garden, he goes back to check on the twelve, and they're sleeping. And he rebukes them and says, Could you not even stay awake with me one hour? And a second time, he goes back to the garden and he prays. And it's like a broken record. He goes back to check on them, and they're sleeping again. 
But notice when he goes back to the garden a third time what is said in verse 44. Matthew 26 and verse 44 says, So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. So as Jesus is in the garden, right before he's about to be betrayed and go to the cross, what is he doing? He's saying repeatedly to the Father the same prayer. That this cup would pass from him, but not his will, but the Lord's will. The Father's will be done. You know, when concerns and cares and stress is heavy on your heart, sometimes you can't help but say the same prayer over and over and over again to God. Asking for his assistance, asking for his help. And it's okay for us to be repetitious in our prayers, to say the same request to God. And why is that okay? Because our Lord did that. And that's not contradictory to what we're talking about in Matthew chapter 6. The emphasis here, and rather, is this idea that you're going to be heard just because you say a lot of words. You guys know the expression, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. That if you just make a lot of noise, eventually you're going to be heard. And you know, kids are smart enough, they figure that out with their parents. You make enough noise, they're going to listen. Is that the way that we're supposed to view our relationship with God? That we're going to be heard with our requests just because we say a lot of words? That's what the pagans, that's what the Gentiles during the time of Christ did. They would have these repetitious chants that wouldn't even have any meaning, any substance, and they would just say it all day and all night, over and over and over again, hoping that their God would hear them. We have an example of that. We won't turn to it, but just for your reference, 1 Kings 18, remember the prophets of Baal? How they all night were, and all day were just trying to get their God's attention and they're mocked. Man. Maybe your God's taking a break. Maybe he's napping. If we want to be different from the world, if we want to be seen as salt and light, and this includes not just, uh, I'm using the, the religious world included in this idea of worldliness as well, that our prayers need to come from the heart. That we should be praying to God with words that are backed with substance, that meaningful intent when we address our Father. And don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that our prayers need to be so eloquent and just flowing off the tongue. Sometimes our prayers are going to be direct, they're going to be blunt, and they're going to be short. And that's okay. But we need to make sure that we are praying with purpose. When the Gentiles pray, they, they didn't care about their attitude or their heart. But that's how the Christian ought to pray. That's what makes us different in how we approach God. Prayer should never be about getting through repetitions or saying a certain line over and over again. Praying is a way, rather, that marks the child of God and will help us be salt and light in the world. But how we address our Father. The last time that we see the Gentiles mentioned in this Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 6 and verse 32. And as Matthew chapter 6 comes to an end of this chapter, we see that Jesus is talking about worry. Worry and anxiety and stress, and let's face it, we worry. We worry about what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, what's going to happen tomorrow. As Americans, we worry so much, we worry about the things we haven't worried about because we haven't had time to properly worry about them first. And we just, we worry, and we worry all the time. And you notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 through 32, that there should be a difference. He says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Everything that Jesus just said, don't, you don't need to worry about that. In the previous verses, those are the very things that the Gentiles' life is consumed with. They're the very thing that they are so worried and stressed about. The necessities of life, the, the food, water, and clothing. What are we going to do about this? And that's what should be different between the child of God and the person that doesn't know God in their life. It should be a matter of faith. That the child of God can trust in God's care. Well, the person of the world is going to be filled with worry about if their needs are going to be met. That's not how salt and light live. They can trust that God is going to provide for the necessities of my life. And I think as Christians, oftentimes we would agree with that statement. 
And I think we can trust in that. And we know that God is going to take care of us. He is going to provide for the necessities. But maybe what we struggle with more is the fact that Jesus doesn't say that he'll provide us with the luxuries. That he doesn't promise the cushy retirement. Doesn't promise the nice big house, the new car, all the different luxuries. And so maybe we struggle with, we identify ourselves less as Christians, but more as American Christians. Getting so caught up in the prosperity of our culture in this country that it influences our stress and our worry. But ultimately what that does is it affects our focus. And so have the things of this world, have they become a vice for us? There's a verse I want you to look at in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 73. Now as I read this verse, I want you to ask yourself, is is this verse true of my life? If I were to ask you to come up here with me and, and read this verse and say it as a statement that you agree with it, could you do that? Psalm 73 and verse 25, where the psalmist asks, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Is that true of my life? There's nothing else on this earth that I desire beside the Lord. I think we're guilty many times that we, like the Gentiles, like the people that don't know God, we're guilty of seeking the material things, the things of this world, we seek that first. And when that happens, we appear no different than the people around us because our priorities are the same. And isn't it ironic what Jesus follows up verse 32 with in verse 33, Matthew 6, 33? A lot of you will recognize this verse, maybe have it memorized. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But is that what we're seeking first? Are we, are we truly seeking first the kingdom of God? No, it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be very challenging, almost impossible for us to truly live as salt and light in the world if our concerns and our priorities are no different than those that we would typically identify as worldly. And maybe what that means is we're worldly too. But the things that Gandhi observed in the 50s and the 30s, I forget exactly what year it was when he observed those things, but could that be said of us today? No, and maybe our material focus is less on stuff in this world. Maybe for you, it's more of the cares of the world. Maybe, maybe that's what you are just primarily concerned with and primarily focused with. To think of how the idol of politics has entered our lives, and it can cause us to lose sight of the heavenly kingdom. Now, we, we hear all the time that the world is so liberal. The world is so progressive, the the culture is just morally bankrupt, it's going downhill and at a steady rate, and so the solution that I heard growing up is that Christians need to vote conservatively. That will change things. And don't get me wrong, I'm not discrediting the, the opportunity to participate and make civil choices and to vote. That's not what I'm saying. But brethren, we read the Sermon on the Mount, we read the Gospels of Christ, and we realize that the kingdom of God that Christ teaches, that's the solution to the world. There's no candidate, there's no platform, there's no party in this country that's magically going to solve America's morality problems. I know that's probably a tough pill for us to swallow, but as Jesus provides us in the Sermon on the Mount, that's what disciples do. We are the difference. We are the salt and the light of this earth and the world. And so this sermon challenges us to be different, to be disciples that can change the world by seasoning it with salt, by shining brightly as light. But if my focus is constantly tied to things of this world, I can't see above it, how am I truly going to be able to have an influence? An influence for the kingdom, because that's what it's about. We'll finish with this passage here, Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 and verse 2, where Paul says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so we need to make sure we are living by this verse, that we don't be conformed to this world. 
And so let's use our influence the way that Christ would have us to, to make disciples of Jesus, to be the salt and the light in this world, to truly be different. And that's how we solve the problems that we're seeing in this world. That's how we solve the problem of sin, not by ourselves, but because of what Christ has done for us. And so we need to be salt. We need to be light. We need to be different. Maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're not a Christian. Maybe there was a word that we were talking about. You saw it on the PowerPoint that stuck out to you, and it's that word Gentile. I know it kind of has a different connotation in the religious world, especially today. Maybe sometimes used harshly. Remember, that word simply is showing somebody that doesn't have a relationship with God. But maybe you've been studying Maybe you've come to know what Jesus has done on the cross, that, he's di- that he died for the forgiveness of your sins, that you can be made right with God, that you can have that relationship, and you're ready to begin that walk. You're ready to repent of your sins and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. We would be so happy to assist you with that this morning. So what a fitting song that we're going to sing. Why do you wait? Don't, don't wait on the most important choice that you could make in life. So if you're here this morning, subject to heaven's invitation, we invite you to come to the front as we stand and sing the song selected.